a very good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is Aro Sharisanak. I'm the president of the Ceylon College of Physicians. Uh, very good morning and welcome to the specialty update on clinical hematology. Now, um, uh, as you all may be aware already, the CCP conducts uh, a theme for each month. And the month of uh, November has been the hematology month. In, to cover this theme, we have uh, about four activities. One is we usually have a college lecture delivered by on a hematology topic, delivered by um, a member of the specialty college. And then there's a specialty update, which brings together about four eminent uh, specialists from that college who will discuss in depth some important aspects of that hematology that specialty. Then of course, uh, every month we have a specialty quiz as well, in which uh, questions based on the college lecture and the, and the uh, specialty update are brought up, uh, a quiz questions, and then most of the, it's mostly the trainees who take part. And then uh, these questions are based on these presentations. And then the one who spoke, scores the highest amount of marks, now number of marks in the shortest possible time gets the award. So that's the CCP quiz for each specialty. Then of course, some months we invite an overseas expert uh, in what's called the cutting edge series to speak on the latest <clears throat> developments in that field. So those are the four activities that usually take place in a theme month. Uh, today, <clears throat> we have uh, the month of hematology and we have two uh, four eminent hematology specialists who will be sharing their expertise with us and i'm uh, grateful to the president of the president of the council of the uh, college of hematologists of sri lanka for helping us organize this and then of course we have one of their <coughs> Uh, uh, representatives of the CCP Council, you all might know, CCP Council, those CCPs that for the physicians, we always have a uh, council place reserved for somebody from pathology, one of the pathology affiliated subjects. So very often we have a hematologist uh, serving on the council of the CCP, and this year it is Professor Senani Williams. So I'm grateful to uh, Professor Williams as well as the president of the college for facilitating all this. <clears throat> Without further ado, I'd like to invite the first speaker for this morning. That will be Dr. Omega Vikramasinghe. She is the acting consultant clinical hematologist at the teaching hospital in Mahamodra Gaul. That's where I work as well. And then she's going to speak to on thrombophilia screening and ever-challenging dilemma. Now, the format is going to be the speaker will make the presentation. And then after the speaker finishes the presentation, we have a few minutes of uh, question time and then about five minutes. And then uh, you can, since this is a webinar, you will have to type in the questions and send to the <clears throat> chat box. And then of course, the one who is modulating the program will look at the questions and answer, uh, provide answers. So that's how it's going to be. And then, uh, of course, we will be presenting the certificate of appreciation to its speaker. So that's how it's going to be. And uh, I will have done the introduction and to carry on the rest of the program, it will be the secretary of the CCP, Dr. Dinesha <coughs> Sudhasinghe. here. Right, okay, over to you, Dr. Omega, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, sir, uh, for that kind introduction. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, we can see your slides very well. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to discuss about a rational approach to thrombophilia screening, including some difficult and challenging situations. Uh, my presentation will be based on a few case scenarios, but before moving to cases, I thought uh, I would briefly discuss about what is meant by thrombophilia screening. Now, the term thrombophilia is uh, generally used to describe hereditary and or acquired condition associated with increased predisposition to thrombosis. 
Now this thrombophilia screening is a very broad process where we do a global and comprehensive and a personalized evaluation of patients for thrombotic state. Now this global thrombophilia evaluation um, is indicated in all patients with thromboembolism, but this thrombophilia specific laboratory screening where we usually meant as um, thrombophilia screening in day-to-day -day clinical practice is uh, uh, indicated on the in selected patient. So we are going to discuss what are these selected cases are. So at the end of this lecture, we are aiming to answer the following questions. Should I offer thrombophilia screening for my patient? If so, what test should I offer and when and how should I do it? Moving to cases, um, case number one, she is Mrs. Uh, J.S., a 26-year-old female, new remarried on combined oral contraceptive pills for three months, presented with painful swelling of right lower limb. And the ultrasound scan revealed right iliofemoral DVT extending up to inferior vena cava. So she has no other provoking factors, but her father and a paternal aunt are both have had young onset DVT and on long-term blood thinners, but their uh, thrombophilic status are unknown. So she was anticoagulated for six months using a direct oral acting anticoagulant, Rivaroxaban. Now, my first question is, does she need thrombophilia screening? The answer is yes. So what test she was offered? She was offered screening for heritable thrombophilia and found to have heterozygous for factor V laden mutation and homozygous for the prothrombin gene mutation. Now, does she need acquired thrombophilia screening? The answer is yes, but only the antiphospholipid syndrome screening. Why? Now, this combination of heterozygous factor V laden mutation and homozygous prothrombin gene mutation is considered a high risk thrombophilic state, where in the presence of acute thrombosis, this patient should be on indefinite anticoagulation unless there's a contraindication. So detecting an additional acquired thrombophilic condition by doing acquired thrombophilia screening will not change our management unless she is found to be triple positive for APLS, then the anticoagulation of choice should be warfarin rather than rivaroxaban. So that is the only indication to go ahead with the acquired thrombophilic screening by doing a APLS screening. Now we have uh, five clearly defined heritable thrombophilias. Uh, mm -hmm. Commonest is the factor V laden mutation and then the prothrombin gene mutation. So these are genetic, uh, uh, now these are detected by um, genetic testing. And then we have uh, three uh, deficiencies of a naturally occurring anticoagulant, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, and antithrombin three deficiency. And uh, these deficiencies are detected by measurement of their plasma activity or the concentration. So these are coagulation-based testing. And we have important acquired thrombophilias. They are the antiphospholipid syndrome, number two, myeloproliferative neoplasms. Um, in the absence of a MPN phenotype, presence of a JAK2 mutation clone is also associated with the high risk of thrombosis. Number three is PNH or the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And malignancy is also considered an important acquired thrombophilic condition. Now, testing for heritable thrombophilia, what are the indications, when and how we should do it? Now, testing for heritable thrombophilia is indicated for patients with venous thromboembolism who are young, less than 40 years of age. Their thrombotic episode can either be spontaneous or may be associated with a weak environmental risk factor and also present in one of the first degree relatives. So there should be a strongly positive family history. And testing should only be used where it will impact our clinical management. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, now these thrombophilic, heritable thrombophilic conditions are very rare. And uh, the prevalence, as I mentioned in my previous slide, was uh, based on Western population. So they are very rare. And um, these investigations are very costly. 
Uh, now these genetic tests like factor V laden will cost about uh, 10,000 rupees if we get them done from private sector. And for the profile of protein C, protein S and antithrombin, uh, which will cost nearly 50,000 if we get it from outside. But we have a few uh, centers doing these tests for public patients uh, at National Hospital Sri Lanka, National Hospital Kandy and Lady Ridgeway Hospital for pediatric patients. Now, all the guidelines suggest testing for heritable thrombophilia and indefinite anticoagulation in positive patients over no testing. Now, when we are testing for heritable thrombophilia, uh, when decided to test, it should be performed only after uh, three months of anticoagulation for acute thrombosis uh, because these naturally occurring anticoagulation anticoagulants are consumed during the acute episode and their levels can be falsely low and acquired problems including warfarin and the potential assay dependent impact of DOAC should be avoided when testing. So we need to do it after three months of initial anticoagulation because the delaying will not impact the acute management and it will prevent repeated testing. So when we decided to screen for this uh, heritable thrombophilia, the coagulation-based component, it should be done after three to six months of initial, initial anticoagulation. And we have to omit warfarin or DOAC before testing. Now it is recommended to maintain a warfarin off treatment period of 10 to 14 days and a DOAC off period of 48 to 72 hours, depending on patient's renal function where we tend to stop for uh, longer duration in renally impaired patients. And then we should start the patient on a short acting anticoagulant, preferably a low molecular weight heparin. And then we omit low molecular weight heparin 24 hours before testing. For patients who are on unfractionated heparin, prophylactic dose like BD dose for renally impaired patient, if they are on unfractionated heparin, we can omit that 12 hours before testing. Soon after the test, we can resume anticoagulation either with low molecular weight heparin or warfarin or with DOAC. Once the target INR is achieved, we can omit inoxaparin and continue warfarin. And the continuation or discontinuation will be depend, depend on the result of the thrombophilia screening. So what are the other important facts regarding uh, testing for heritable thrombophilia? Now, testing after a venous thromboembolism is not recommended as a routine guide, uh, as a routine to guide management decisions like intensity, choice, or the monitoring of anticoagulation therapy, except in antithrombin-3 deficiency, where there is a place for antithrombin-3 concentrates. And guidelines do not recommend routine thrombophilia testing to first-degree relatives of people with history of VTE. However, Selected testing of asymptomatic first-degree relatives of patients with protein C, S, and antithrombin deficiency is indicated if it influences the management and life choices. For an example, females of childbearing age before the pregnancy. Okay, then uh, some studies have shown that there are other genetic variants. They have shown that there is uh, some association between uh, thrombosis and these genetic variants. They are the variants of MTHFR or the methyl tetrahydrofluorate reductase system, or the variants of serpin 1, which encode for plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, which is a component of fibrinolytic pathway, and variants of factor 13. But uh, some studies, the other studies have failed to demonstrate that relationship. Therefore, the association with thrombosis is not consistent with these genetic variants and their effect is too, too small to alter the management. Therefore, uh, the, the current guideline does not recommend genetic testing for these variants in thrombotic events uh, without a clinically significant link to thrombosis. So moving to case number two, she's a 59-year-old female, known patient uh, with diabetes, hypertension, um, and dyslipidemia, presented to the emergency department with sudden onset of shortness of breath. On admission, she was hypoxic with 
oxygen saturation of 94%, tachycardic with blood pressure of 100 by 70. On examination, she had a mild swelling of right lower limb, which was noticed for two days, but not attended for any medical advice. On detailed questioning, she also gave a history of two episodes of postmenopausal spotting, which was again not investigated. Um, so he, her 2D echo revealed uh, right ventricular strain pattern, and therefore she was managed as intermediate risk pulmonary embolism for owing light, right lower limb DVT, and she was started on immediate anticoagulation using subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin. On the following day, she had a CTPA, which demonstrated a fill-in defect in right pulmonary artery, confirming the diagnosis. Now, my first question is, does she need thrombophilia screening? Answer is yes. So what was she offered? She was screened for a possible underlying malignancy, but for other acquired thrombophilic conditions, she was not screened because this 59-year-old female has developed an in the absence of an underlying malignancy, this 59-year-old female has developed an unprovoked DVT and she should be on long-term anticoagulation unless contraindicated. So uh, detecting an acquired, additional acquired thrombophilic condition will not change our management except where we should screen her for an underlying malignancy. So uh, when uh, this can be done, this can be done while on primary treatment because it will have an impact on the management because our idea is to detect an underlying malignancy as early as possible and start uh, cancer-related therapy if it is positive. And this testing is not affected by anticoagulation treatment. Now, her best examination was normal. Biomanual examination revealed an enlarged uterus with no other palp investigation revealed iron deficiency with reactive thrombocytosis. Now it was decided that she should have an endometrial biopsy as early as possible to exclude an underlying malignancy. Therefore, after six weeks of high risk period of anticoagulation, she under that she had IVC filter with bridging anticoagulation pre-procedure and histology revealed endometrial, invasive endometrial carcinoma. Right, now what is the association between malignancy and thrombosis? Venous thromboembolism may be the earliest sign of cancer. However, extensive screening for an underlying cancer in unprovoked VTE should be done only if clinical history, physical examination, and basic investigations are suspicious of an underlying malignancy. When decided to do so, we have to do age and gender specific limited cancer screening. Now, when screening for an underlying malignancy, as for other things, we should start with basic investigations. If um, basic study investigation suggestive of uh, iron deficiency, then these patients should be offered iron studies and stool for occult blood if there is no obvious external bleeding. And in selected patients, uh, we can consider upper and lower GI endoscopy. Regarding imaging, chest x-ray should be considered for patients with uh, respiratory symptoms or sign and then CT scan of whole body or the relevant area, depending on where we suspect the malignancy, and the mammogram and ultrasound scan breast for suspected breast malignancies. Um, so it is recommended that we should go for a tissue biopsy in suspected lesion to demonstrate an underlying malignancy. Moving to case number three, a 36-year-old male presented with sudden loss of vision CT brain done on admission was negative, but the MRI with MR venogram done on day three of presentation revealed hemorrhagic infarction of bilateral occipital lobes and cerebellar hemispheres due to thrombosis of left transverse sinus. So he was diagnosed to have cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is a thrombosis of unusual size. So what are the other areas? 
which uh, are called thrombosis of unusual sites. They are splanchnic vein thrombosis, retinal vein thrombosis, upper extremity venous thrombosis, and rarely patients can have genitourinary venous thrombosis. Now, our patient has uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. What thrombophilia screening was offered for him? So it was planned to screen for acquired thrombophilia known to cause cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Heritable thrombophilia screening was not done. Basically, there was no positive family history. So this is the laboratory workup for him. His full blood count and blood picture was normal. There was no evidence of cytopenia suggestive of PNH or hemolysis, no evidence of a myeloproliferative disorder. Uh, in the absence of JAK2 phenotype, in the absence of MPD phenotype, uh, we did JAK2 mutation, which was negative. Autoimmune profile was also negative, but APLS screening revealed that he has positive lupus anticoagulant and heritable thrombophilia screening was not done. So, bit about antiphospholipid syndrome, it is an acquired thrombophilic condition associated with pregnancy morbidity and both arterial and venous thrombosis. Therefore, testing is recommended for patients with unprovoked DVT, including unusual sites, arterial thrombosis, including strokes, and in pregnancy losses. So, laboratory workup for APA, three tests um, available to diagnose um, um, on laboratory basis. Uh, one of these tests should be positive and persistent positivity should be demonstrated at least 12 weeks apart. They are lupus anticoagulant, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is assessed by a coagulation-based method. So the preparation and the uh, preparation and the timing um, uh, should be similar um, that I um, explained during heritable thrombophilia screening plot based component. The other components are anti-cardiolipin antibodies and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies. So these are immune assays and uh, anticoagulation therapy does not affect these assays. Few words about PNH. PNH is a cana acquired thrombophilic condition characterized by presence of blood cells, which are deficient of GPI and protein, resulting in chronic complement activation, leading to intravascular hemolysis and thrombosis. So up to 10% of patients present with thrombosis and the neutrophil Crohn's size correlate with the thrombotic risk. Therefore, it is recommended that uh, patients with uh, unprovoked thrombosis should be tested for PNH if the basic blood investigation suggestive of cytopenia or hemolysis. Now we have few laboratory tests available for screening and confirmation of PNH. For screening, we use HAM test or acidified serum lysis test, which is available in most of the hematology laboratories where we demonstrate an exaggerated hemolysis uh, when patients of PNH patients, red blood cells are as added to a acidified serum when compared to normal serum. And then we have a um, test called urine for hemosiderine, where we demonstrate hemosiderine um, in urine in patients with chronic intravascular hemolysis by using pearl stain. Uh, gold standard test for confirmation of flow cytometry, uh, confirmation of PNH is flow cytometry, where we demonstrate a population which are deficient of GPI anchor protein. Here we use a specific type of flow cytometry called flare flow cytometry. We use a fluorescein labeled aerolysin reagent, which has a high affinity to these GPI anchor protein. So it is uh, easy to demonstrate this deficient population. Now, um, this PNH flow cytometry is available at Medical Research Institute Colombo at Hematology Department for public patients. But um, I think these days they have a problem with reagents. Uh, if we are getting it done from the outside for basic test, it will cost about 37,000 rupees. Uh, myeloproliferative uh, disorders. Uh, we have three um, uh, 
common uh, MPNs, they are polycythemia rubra vera, essential thrombocytemia, and primary myelofibrosis. Now, what are the recommendations for testing for myeloproliferative neoplasms in thrombosis? So, testing with MPN panel, which include the most common mutations we see in myeloproliferative neoplasms, they are JAK2 mutation, CALR and MPL, is recommended for thrombosis at unusual site and arterial thrombosis with evidence of a myeloproliferative disorder on fluid blood count. Genetic testing with JAK2 mutation is indicated in splanctic vein thrombosis and cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, even in the absence of a uh, clear MPN phenotype uh, with a normal full blood count. So this is the mutational profile we see in MPN patients. You can see the most prevalent mutations are JAK2, JAK2 exon 12, MPL, and CALRAR with a lot of other mutations seen in low frequencies. And in the bone marrow, for each uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, we see some salient features. For an example, in essential thrombocytemia, we see uh, megakaryocytic proliferation with large uh, megakaryocytes, which are hyperlobulated, uh, showing uh, staghorn nuclei um, in the megakaryocyte in ET. So moving to case number four, he is 39-year-old male, presented to the emergency department with chest pain and found to have myocardial infarction. He has no cardiovascular risk factors, except uh, he is an uh, ex-smoker, quit five years back, but his uh, smoking history was not that much significant. He gave a history of consuming one to two cigarettes per day for two years when he was working abroad. And uh, he has no other cardiovascular risk factors and there was no positive family history of uh, MI or premature cardiac deaths. So coronary angiogram revealed single vessel disease with no structural defects. Bloods revealed normal lipid profile, normal blood sugar level, and his autoimmune profile was negative. And he was referred to hematology for thrombophilia screening. Now, this is a sticky situation. Should we offer thrombophilia screening for him? Yes, we did some thrombophilia screening. Full blood count and blood picture revealed um, normal blood counts with no evidence of cytopenia or hemolysis. Therefore, PNH and MPN testing was not done. His JAK2 mutation was negative. APLS screening was also negative. Since there were some observational studies which have shown moderately increased risk of MI with factor V laden mutation and pro thrombin gene variation. Those tests were also done because the patient could afford for them and those tests were negative. Other heritable thrombophilia screening was not done. So what are the recommendations regarding arterial clots? Now it is recommended that patients with arterial thrombosis in the absence of other vascular risk factors, we should screen for APLS syndrome. In patient with arterial thrombosis plus abnormal blood parameters should be tested for MPN and PNH. Association with factor V laden and prothrombin gene variation is not consistent. Therefore, the current guideline does not recommend testing for them. Testing for other heritable thrombophilia is not recommended in patients with arterial thrombosis because as per current guideline, the association is weak and does not alter the management. They specifically talk about strokes and testing for heterobal thrombophilia is not recommended as per current recommendations, regardless of the age. Moving to my last case, she is um, Mrs. TH, a 32-year-old female, referred to hematology department from antenatal clinic. She has four recurrent first trimester miscarriages. Possible structural abnormalities of the uterus were excluded. Her hormonal profile was normal, and mother and father had normal karyotyping. Now, what investigation should we offer to investigate this recurrent pregnancy losses? From hematology point of view, we went ahead with APLS screening, which was negative. Then she was referred to a clinical genetist by her obstetrician, and she had few genetic testing done, including factor V laden, 
MTHFR variant and plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, 4G, 5G genotype testing. And she was found to be positive for this 4G, 5G insertion deletion variant. Now, um, there was a meta-analysis um, demonstrating that there is an uh, association between uh, this uh, variation uh, variant positivity and recurrent pregnancy losses and some beneficial effect of enoxaparin. She was started on prophylactic anticoagulation with subcutaneous enoxaparin and her pregnancy is continuing reaching to the second trimester. But what are the recommendations regarding pregnancy, morbidity and thrombophilia screening? All the guidelines, including American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, recommend against heritable thrombophilia screening in women with pregnancy complications. Uh, they recommend to screen for uh, antiphospholipid syndrome in pregnancy morbidity, uh, but this antiphospholipid uh, antibody testing should be avoided during pregnancy. Now, we have a few um, uh, guidelines available which gives us uh, very comprehensive and evidence-based information about thrombophilia screening. One of them is uh, BCSH guideline on thrombophilia screening, where we see one of the uh, Sri Lankan hematologists appear as one of the co-authors. And we have uh, ISTH or the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis guideline. And then we have American Society of Hematology guideline which has published a recent draft recommendation on thrombophilia testing. Now, these guidelines are freely accessible and available, so I would um, suggest all of you to refer these guidelines um, during your day-to-day -day clinical practice, because um, in clinical practice, we see a lot of unnecessary thrombophilia testing and a lot of unnecessary hematology requests for thrombophilia testing because there is no clear consensus recommendation among physicians. So in summary, routine screening of patients with venous thromboembolism for an underlying thrombophilic defect is not justified. Instead, we should do target testing for high-risk patients. And we should carefully select patients and we have to do it at correct time with correct preparation, which will avoid unnecessary testing and repeated testing, which will cut down cost, especially during the economic crisis we have. So the test results may be useful in managing length of anticoagulation during pregnancy. Women with a history of VT who wish to become be treated differently if a defect were found. And asymptomatic relatives of affected patients do not require thrombophilia testing unless clinically indicated. Testing during acute anticoagulant therapy is not indicated as the duration of primary therapy is decided by the type of event, not by the presence of the abnormality and the thrombophilia test may be negative in up to a majority of patients with thrombosis if carried out without a proper clinical review. So these are my references and thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Omega, for that uh, excellent and uh, informative talk on thrombophilia. Uh, the forum is open for questions. We can have a couple of minutes. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can type into Q&A um, section. And uh, we don't have any questions yet, but uh, I am. Uh, I have. I, we do have one question, Dinesha. Uh, yes. uh, there's one question from Dr. Nadishani. Actually, I think it is also already answered. Once a patient is diagnosed with a hereditary thrombophilic condition, should his or her family be screened? Omega. Yes, um, it should be considered in a special situation, like uh, um, if that patient is having siblings, female siblings who are of childbearing age, they should be screened. And that is the current recommendation. Thank you, Omega. And of course, if somebody is going for a high-risk procedure, some close family member, then of course, uh, it's preferable to screen them. Any other questions? I can't see any. 
Um, let me ask one question from Dr. Omega. So because of COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen lots of patients with uh, thrombotic tendencies. Yes. Um, have you seen uh, patients with like uh, it, this regarding treatment, like heparin resistance? Uh, because a uh, lot of uh, kidney patients, uh, we have seen, uh, we had problems with, uh, uh, give, while, despite giving a heparin, prophylaxis, uh, they tend to uh, had, have clotting. So there are uh, concerns regarding whether there is any uh, deficiency of antithrombin 3. So I just would like to know when you have come across anything like that. I have, uh, of course, not have come across personally such a thing. Um, I would like to uh, direct that question to uh, Anoma, madam, to see whether she has got any um experiences but i also did notice any uh, uh, there were patient uh, getting thrombus uh, thrombosis while on uh, anticoagulant but i yeah. don't know actually whether there is due to heparin resistant or there is any other underlying conditions or thrombo uh, thrombotic uh, condition causing this effect Okay, thank you very much. Um, since we don't have any other questions, probably uh, uh, we will move on to the next talk. Uh, so thank you very much once again, uh, Dr. Omegra Vikramasinghe. And on behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians, I would like to uh, share a hand over the certificate of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's uh, move on to the second talk. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's, uh, it's on uh, bruises and bleeds, guide to a systematic approach. And the talk is going to be delivered by Dr. Amila Amarasena. She's a consultant histopathologist at Teaching Hospital on Radhapura. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Amarasena to conduct her talk. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dinesha. I'm consultant clinical hematologist. So, uh, good morning, all. Uh, this presentation is based on diagnostic approach to an adult uh, presented with uh, bleeding. So, uh, this is the outline of my presentation, and I would touch each topic in the next 30 minutes. Uh, bleeding is a common symptom in general population, and they would present with the history of uh, bleeding or with abnormal blood test. So uh, how to identify patients who are real bleeders is challenging. Laboratory workup should be limited to only selected patients because these blood tests are not uh, costly and not readily, readily and widely available. So here I am giving a brief outline of mechanism of hemostasis. As you all know, this is a multiple interlinked process. Four main factors are involved, uh, vascular structure, plasma clotting factors, platelets, and fibrinolytic system. So this diagram highlights two main steps of hemostasis. The initial step, primary hemostasis. Uh, it forms a weak platelet plug assisted by one minimum factor. So this takes place within about five seconds after the vessel damage. Uh, and the secondary hemostasis makes a stable fibrin clot, activating the clotting cascade. Remodeling and uh, vessel remodeling of the vessel damage and fibrinolysis uh, start later. Uh, so this diagram uh, on the same process, so I have illustrated which components can go wrong. Uh, defects in primary hemostasis cause microcutaneous bleeding. Abnormalities are defect in vascular structure, thrombocytopenia, platelet dysfunction, and von Willebrand factor deficiency. Clotting factor def deficiencies affect secondary hemostasis, and the result is deeply seated bleeding. Delayed bleeding is expected with defective fibrinolytic mechanisms. So this BC slide has summarized most of uh, differential diagnosis for the uh, failures of uh, all four components. 
Vascular defects are few, including both acquired and inherited disorders. Defective fibrinolysis can be due to fibrinolytic drugs or very rarely it can be inherited. Uh, defect, uh, both qualitative and quantitative platelet defects are commonly encountered disorders and uh, they were uh, covered in uh, our previous lecture. So my main focus is the coagulation factor deficiencies. Inherited deficiencies uh, most of the time uh, involve single factors giving mild to severe phenotype and the most common uh, disease is von Willebrand disease followed by hemophilia A and B. Uh, acquired defects are listed here. So these are inhibitors such as acquired hemophilia and von Willebrand uh, syndrome, defective production, no activation seen in liver disease and vitamin K deficiency, anticoagulant therapy and consumptive coagulopathies such as DIC and snake bite. Except inhibitors, other causes uh, largely involve multiple protein factors. So this triangle gives an interesting uh, phenomena of inherited bleeding disorders. So more common inherited bleeding disorders are uh, mild in severity and more difficult to be uh, diagnosed. So the base of uh, the triangle uh, shows bleeding of undefined cause which comprises about 50 to 60% of cases, and it has failed to find a diagnosis even after extensive laboratory workup. In contrast, severe forms such as uh, hemophilia AB and type 3 von Willebrand disease are less prevalent and fairly easy to make the diagnosis. So bleeding patients you mainly encounter the adults and elders, while teenagers and young adults are lesser in frequency. Since the age of onset is delayed in this age group, uh, they have more chance of having milder forms of inherited bleeding disorders and uh, acquired forms. So most of them uh, may belong to the uh, bottom, of, bottom part of this triangle, so which has the biggest diagnostic dilemma. Therefore, the diagnosis is challenging. Only the patients who give a suggestive history should be separated at the time of history taking. So uh, I put this slide to emphasize that an isolated coagulation test result will not guide us for a diagnosis. They could even misguide us. So I will uh, pick up a few examples. Uh, prolonged APT is not always associated with bleeding, such as in factor 12 deficiency. Uh, factor 7 deficiency is a well-known abnormality in liver disease, and it's incorrectly correlated with the bleeding risk. The patient with liver disease could produce enough factor 7 to achieve hemostasis inside the body, but this factor 7 will, uh, level is not enough to normalize prothrombin uh, in vitro. Another example is that uh, normal PT and APTT would not essentially exclude milder forms of one minimum disease and hemophilia. Therefore, the most important initial bleeding test is proper bleeding history. Uh, because without any symptoms, an abnormal coagulation test results have no value. And with a good history, you may just need basic test of hemostasis in laboratory diagnosis. So let's start systematic approach to a bleeding patient. At the end of the, uh, this uh, bleeding assessment history, you should, you should answer these questions. Is this a bleeder or non-bleeder? Is it severe or mild? Is this a primary or secondary hemostatic defects? Is, it, is this inherited? Uh, and what may be the likely diagnosis? So as shown here, uh, you should cover three main components, uh, site of bleeding, how severe the bleeding was, and the timing, when was it developed, and the frequency. So let me discuss them one by one. So site of bleeding gives a clue about uh, which step of hemostasis has failed. So red circles uh, indicate mucocutaneous bleeding. They include nose bleeding, excessive bleeding from uh, minor wounds and uh, menstrual bleeding. Hemarthrosis, muscle and intracranial bleedings are deep bleeding episodes and they are more likely due to protein factor deficiencies. However, uh, this is not always true. You all know hemophilia A and B have typical deep, deep bleeding patterns. 
but some other factor deficiencies have variable pattern of bleeding. Uh, for, for an example, factor five, factor seven, and factor 11 deficiencies commonly cause uh, mucocutaneous bleeding and prolong or excessive bleeding following surgery. The timing of bleeding has different aspects. So it includes whether it was spontaneous or secondary to trauma, surgery, and topical defects, uh, age of first presentation, and which gives a clue about inherited or acquired causes, and frequency of recurring symptoms. This may indicate whether the bleeding is significant or not. As mentioned here, uh, recurrent, severe, and spontaneous bleeds have higher possibility of bleeding disorders. So how do we get an idea about the severity? So these uh, things you could gather in, in the history are any intervention required, uh, such as packing, cauterization, and defibrillatic therapy and symptoms of hypovolemia and history of blood transfusions, delayed hospital discharge and late onset iron deficiency anemia. And calculation of the amount of blood loss helps objective assessment of the severity. So uh, minor bleeding secondary to a cut injury which resolves itself at home is not a feature of bleeding disorder. So not only the current bleeding episodes, but also previous episodes should uh, also be evaluated. So childhood history of significant bleeding uh, indicate inherited defects and excessive bleeding following hemostatic challenges such as tooth extraction, minor or major surgery, postpartum period indicate serious bleeding. So not only the current bleeding episodes, uh, and other past medical history, family history, and drug history are also important. So past medical history gives clues about acquired causes and further guide to limit unnecessary investigations. So as I listed here, chronic liver cell disease causes multiple protein factor deficiency and thrombocytopenia related bleeding. Uremia is a cause for acquired platelet function defects. SLE uh, can produce uh, inhibitors. So if we know the previous diagnosis of any bleeding problem, it will definitely be time-saving. For an example, you can come across with a patient having multiple ecumotic patches and relapse ITP may be the cause. And if a diagnosis is already established, some investigations are unnecessary. When you have a hemophilia A patient with hemarthrosis, don't do a PTT. The only option is the factor correction. Uh, can a bleeder, uh, bleeding disorder complicate with thrombosis? Yes, uh, rare inherited bleeding disorders such as uh, dysfibrogenemia, dysprothrombinemia, and factor 11 deficiency can cause arterial and venous thrombosis. They are, therefore, ask about prior history of thrombosis. And dysfibrogenemia and factor 13 deficiency are, deficiencies are associated with miscarriages. Drug history is another important component. So do you know that the most common cause for acquired coagulopathy related bleeding is antithrombotic therapy? So uh, direct questioning can be done on antiplatelets, anticoagulants, and drugs uh, causing thrombocytopenia. Some of other classes are included in this table. Uh, if we know the drugs patient is on, interpretation of abnormal coagulation test results become more easier. So it is obvious that warfarin causes prolongation of prothrombin time and high INR as well as prolonged APTT. However, early uh, stage of warfarin therapy uh, causes only the prolongation of prothrombin time. So uh, another example that you all know about the direct oral anticoagulant therapy and it does not need monitoring with clotting test. But if we uh, come across with the clotting test, uh, which was done on patient who is on DOAC, so they can cause a variable pattern of prolongation of PTA, PTT, and thrombate time uh, at the therapeutic drug, drug level, as well as uh, at the dose of uh, higher doses. So uh, the family history, uh, in the family history, always take time to identify the pattern of positivity, and it is good to make a predictive trait. So this table shows pattern of inheritance of in, uh, protein factor deficiencies. Most of them are in the rare bleeding disorder group, 
except hemophilia A, B, and von Willebrand disease. As shown here, von Willebrand disease and fibrinogen deficiencies can be inherited as both autosomal dominant and recessive. So rare autosomal recessive disorders should be concerned when the patient is from a region of greater prevalence of these disorders or the culture that accepts consanguinity. One, one example is factor 11 deficiency, which is autosomal recessive inheritance and highly prevalent among uh, Chavis people. Okay, let's move on to the clinical examination. The photos shows uh, skin bleeds, uh, petechiae, purpura, and ex extensive ecchymosis, and hematosis mainly involves weight-bearing joints. So it is good to keep in mind that every bleeds are not always secondary to a coagulopathy. So these are skin manifestations of scurvy and HSP, which are not associated with any coagulopathy. Okay, uh, so now uh, we have reached the main part I want to highlight in this presentation, the bleeding assessment tool or BAT. So this easily helps and guide us to pick up clinically significant bleed uh, among other non-significant bleeders. So it is standardized and it translates bleeding symptoms into a score. So it is sensitive and validated to both one bleeding disease and inherited platelet function, function defects. So it's go within the normal range and uh, negative family history essentially ruled out further investigations. Currently practicing BAT is standardized by International Society for Hemostasis and Thrombosis and uh, designed to be assessed by a medical person. Self-assessment bat are also there. And the whole process uh, takes about 20 minutes and it can be applied to all age groups. So here, uh, these are the 14 categories of symptoms assessed in BAT score. And they can broadly be categorized as spontaneous bleeding, including microcutaneous and deep bleeding and bleeding secondary to hemostatic challenges. Uh, and symptoms and treatment before and at the time of diagnosis should be reported. So this is the first page of that. And the first step is to identify the category of uh, bleeding, which is uh, on the left side. Then pick up the relevant severity score among uh, five uh, groups, uh, scoring zero to four. The highest reported severity within the course of bleeding episode should be selected. And distinction between score zero and one is important. There are minimum criteria to decide whether the bleeding is non-specific or significant. So these are the minimum requirements to say the bleeding is significant. So out of 14 categories, a few of symptoms are included here. For example, epistaxis uh, becomes significant only if it lasts more than 10 minutes, more than five episodes per year, and not associated with secondary causes, or any episode interfere or distress with daily or social activities. So I have included a few more symptoms here. So let, let's take uh, menstrual blood loss into an account. So it is significant if these symptoms are there, and it can also be measured by the pictorial blood loss assessment tool shown here. So after getting the sum of score, these are the cutoff values. It is abnormal and need laboratory workup if the score is four or more for adult male, six or more for adult female, and three or more for a child. You can get an idea how, uh, of how to calculate bad score by doing few case scenarios. The first one, a 35 year old male came with epistaxis, which lasted for about 10 minutes, and he was admitted and bleeding was only arrested by nasal packing. Hemoglobin was normal. He gave a history of one episode of hematuria, which was settled without any medical consultation few months back. Family history and drug history were absent. So on the BAT score, the epistaxis uh, is, uh, score is three, and for the hematuria, it is only one. So the sum of the score is four, which is abnormal for an adult male. Therefore, he needs laboratory diagnostic workup. Uh, second case, she is 45 year old, 
and had the episode of Malina and referred for aperture endoscopy, which was normal. Hemoglobin was 11.5 gram per deciliter. She also gave a history of calf muscle hematoma following a fall from a height. Family and drug history were absent. So on the back score, uh, GI bleeding, the severity uh, was only the consultation because she did not uh, require the surgical hemostasis. So this score is two. And for the muscle hematoma, it is, uh, the score is one. So the uh, sum of the score is three, which is normal for adult female. And further investigations are not required. I, okay, just, uh, this is about the primary screening. So some centers do one variable disease screening and platelet light transmission aggregometry as the primary step. So this is proven to increase the sensitivity of catching up milder form of one variable disease and platelet function defects. Uh, choice of secondary confirmatory test depends on the pattern of abnormality uh, seen in the primary steps. So these include mixing studies and specific uh, protein factor assays, including factor eight, factor nine, factor 11, uh, vice versa. So the third step uh, is real indicator. For an example, uh, fibrinolytic defects need uh, this investigation such as alpha-2 antiplasmin anti function assay. So uh, here I have uh, included hematology units, which are doing primary and secondary diagnostic tests in Sri Lanka. So all teaching hospitals, provincial general hospitals and district general hospitals, uh, including base hospitals, uh, where hematologists work, do the primary screening. Uh, and 10 centers were as diagnostic centers. Centers are listed here, and they all do factor eight and nine levels. Some of them do one with one antigen and function assay, and few can arrange other factor assays. However, the capacity of testing has largely been affected currently due to this economic crisis. And here I have uh, mentioned the estimated reagent cost per each test. Okay, now uh, we will concentrate on lab, laboratory workup. So uh, this would recall you about uh, basic of laboratory PT uh, involved factor seven deficiency. This slide uh, would recall you about basics of laboratory coagulation uh, workup. So the prolongation of uh, prothrombin time indicate factor seven deficiency and uh, AP, only APTT is prolonging factor uh, uh, 8, 9, 11, and 12 deficiencies. And common pathway defects involve factor 5, 10, prothrombin, and fibrinogen deficiencies. So, okay, when we come across with abnormal test reports, what is the next step? The first, uh, we should rule out uh, false positive results. So, we look for pre test errors. Uh, such as uh, the underfilled blood collection tubes prolong both PT and APTT, and blood collection through a central line without discarding first 10 ml of blood can force a prolonged PT, APTT, and thrombin time because of the heparin contamination. Uh, thrombocytopenia is always be confirmed on blood picture to exclude pseudothrombocytopenia. So then the abnormal test is repeated on a second blood sample. If it is also positive, proceed with other investigations. So next step is to rule out whether this uh, prolongation of clotting, fact, uh, clotting test is due to clotting factor deficiency or factor inactivation by inhibitors. So confirmatory clotting factor assays can be arranged uh, accordingly. So here I have included three slides to demonstrate diagnostic workup of common pattern of abnormalities in a simplified way. So this is for prothrombin time. So you can get an idea about mixing studies as well. So when the pre is prolonged, uh, the test is repeated uh, with the plasma sample, which has one-to-one -one proportion of plate, patient's plasma and normal plasma. So this is called mixing study. Correction of the test indicate factor deficiency, 
Since the inhibitors could inactivate factors, even in the normal plasma adult, test would not be corrected. So if uh, factor deficiency is suspected for in isolated prolongation of prothrombin time, then the confirmatory test or second step is factor seven assay. So this illustrates the order of testing when only APT is prolonged. Uh, for suspected factor deficiencies, it should be started with factor eight and one milligram screening as uh, they are more common than other factor deficiencies. Then factor nine and factor 11 assays can be arranged accordingly. Uh, when both PT and APTT are prolonged, do thrombin time. If all are prolonged, the first step is to exclude heparin contamination or heparin treatment. Uh, then proper clinical history uh, can be used to rule out vitamin K deficiency, liver disease, warfarin therapy, and even DIC as acquired causes. Uh, fibrinogen deficiency or dysfunction can be confirmed by fibrinogen activity and antigen assay. So if all PT, APTT, thrombin time, and platelet counts are normal in a patient with high BAT score, what are the possible leading disorders? Mild one variable disease, even milder forms of hemophilia and platelet function defects needs to be ruled out. So if these are negative, then think about factor 13 deficiency, cross-solubility test is the screening test, and factor assay, 13 assay is the confirmatory test. Uh, so I have uh, come to the end of my presentation. So these are a few take-home messages. Uh, bleeding history is the most important test of hemostasis. Abnormal clotting tests not always uh, correctly indicate the risk of bleeding. Normal coagulation tests not always reassuring. Uh, and use of bleeding assessment tool to evaluate patients with suspected bleeding disorders is recommended. Normal score on the ISTH bat essentially ruled out uh, the need for further evaluation. Thank you for listening. We'll move on to the next talk, uh, which is uh, Unraveling Cytopenias by Dr. Vishaka Rajapaksha. She is a consultant clinical hematologist at District General Hospital, Navalapitiya. Over to you, Dr. Rajapaksha, to continue your talk. So today I'm going to discuss 10 clinical cases uh, which were referred to me over the last few years. Uh, all were quite similar clinical presentations, uh, but uh, finally they all got uh, different diagnoses. So we will discuss uh, some take-home messages of each and every case. So uh, let's start. Uh, my first case regarding a newly married young lady who complained body aches for a few days duration. Uh, actually, uh, she married one of uh, our laboratory employees because um, of her complaint he had arranged for that country. Unfortunately, it came as pancytopenia. You can imagine the anxiety of a new couple having this kind of uh, full blood count report with hemoglobin 6.3 and platelet 36 inch into the power 9 per liter. So I was requested to see uh, this urgent blood film to give the diagnosis. And so I investigated to see what had happened. Her blood film was uh, compatible uh, to pancytopenia, but there was no uh, circulating any abnormal cells. As it is not clinically compatible, I observed the sample and noticed that there were small clots uh, in the sample. These small blood clots had consumed all cell lines at, and it presented as pancytopenia. So it was pre-analytical error. Uh, repeat full blood count using a new sample was totally normal. Pre-analytical errors are the commonest errors happening in the laboratory setup. Uh, it could be due to various reasons, poor mixing, uh, wrong techniques of intersection, incorrect tubes, uh, sample mix-up, wrong labeling, and so on. 
It can give falsely high or low values, maybe pancytopenia, bicytopenia, or uh, maybe you get polycythemia depending on the laboratory error. Uh, so before taking clinical decisions like blood product transfusion, postponed surgeries, or requesting further investigations, please check whether they are clinically compatible. If it is clinically incompatible, repeat the test using fresh sample. Uh, so let's move on to case number two. A 28-year-old pregnant woman, P2Z1, admitted for emergency LSCS due to fetal distress. Uh, they have done urgent full blood count and found to have bicytopenia with hemoglobin 9.8 and platelet 38, 36, intended power 9 per litre. So I got a call from consultant anesthetic asking the safe mode of anesthesia for this platelet count. Platelet count above 70 is safe for epidural or spinal anesthesia, but anyway, before advising for the management, I arrange urgent blood film to confirm the platelet count. So you could see, uh, you could see how was it uh, look like. Uh, there were lots of platelet clumps, uh, which was induced by EDT reagents in the full blood count tube. So it's again pre-analytical error. Her actual platelet count was normal. So I put another blood film for your reference to show normal distribution of platelets. So you could see uh, the clumping of platelets of this patient. So this error is not an uncommon uh, as estimated prevalence is 0.1 to 2% in hospitalized patients. So you have to be more careful when you are taking clinical decision. You might give incorrect diagnosis or inappropriate treatment. So EDTA-induced platelet clumps is a vitro phenomenon. That means it occurs outside our body. It occurs uh, due to autoantibodies which act on platelets in the presence of anticoagulant. But that antibodies has no clinical significance at all. Uh, so this mechanism is quite different from the previous case uh, I discussed. Because if you request full blood count using the same anticoagulant bottle, you will get similar errors report. So you have to request blood film or contact hematology lab to confirm the cytopenias. We might advise you to repeat full blood count in a different anticoagulated tube, maybe citrated or heparin tube, or we can, we can arrange uh, blood collection and blood film uh, preparation under 37 or sometimes we can give a manual platelet count using patient's finger prick sample. So let's move to case number three. 16 years old boy presented with loss of appetite and tiredness for two weeks. Uh, he got icterus, pallor, and mild to moderate splenomegaly. His full blood count shows pancytopenia with leukopenia, hemoglobin 3.7 gram per deciliter, with platelet 36 in 10 to the power 9 per liter, with very high LDH level. So he was referred to me to exclude hematological malignancies. His blood film showed macrocytic red cells with hyper-segmented neutrophils. He was a strict vegan, not consume meat, dairy products, eggs, or any product derived from animals. So his diagnosis was megaloblastic anemia. I didn't do uh, bone marrow biopsy for this patient. I started uh, folic acid and vitamin B12 treatment, and she, uh, he recovered fully. Uh, therefore, nutritional anemias are very common nowadays, especially areas like I'm working in Navalapitiya, Hatton, and Dikoya. We get lots of severe iron deficiency, mixed deficiency anemia, or uh, megaloblastic anemia. Therefore, dietary history is very important to avoid unnecessary investigations like bone marrow biopsy, uh, which is uh, invasive, or a seroferritin or B12 levels. Uh, these are very expensive uh, testing. So if you ask them, uh, are you vegetarian? They might say no. 
But if you ask uh, frequently of uh, consuming egg, fish or meat, uh, maybe once a week or maybe twice a month, which is totally inadequate. So you have to be more careful when you're asking history because they are not vegetarian, but maybe they don't have money to buy these kind of hi-fi uh, foods nowadays because of the expenses. Uh, so sometimes, and they uh, might be not emaciated because they consume high carbohydrate diet, but they are anemic. So you have to be more tactful when you are uh, getting history. And uh, if you are confident enough, it is nutritional deficiency straight away. You start with hematonics and to follow up and see whether the patient is responding to your treatment. So let's move to case number four. A 16 years old boy presented with fever and back pain for three days. Uh, he got mild ictorus, pallor, and mild spiromegaly. Full blood count again, pancytopenia with uh, leukopenia, hemoglobin 6.1, mild thrombocytopenia with high LDH. So same age with a clinic, similar clinical presentation as previous case. So he was referred again to exclude hematological malignancy. In his case, his blood film showed red cell agglutinations, polychromatic cells, and some nucleated red blood cells. So it was compatible with uh, hematic anemia, and uh, we arranged pool test or that test, so it was positive with C3D specificity, so it was confirmed as call type autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Also, there were leukopenia with reactive lymphocytes. Uh, it is due to viral infection, so he got viral induced thrombocytopenia. We exclude COVID infection uh, for this boy because he admitted in COVID season. Uh, his rapid antigen test was negative because we have seen patients uh, with COVID infection present with both cold or warm time autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So anyway, our patient, he recovered fully with supportive care with red cell transfusion and folic acid treatment without any complication. So his diagnosis was autoimmune hemolytic anemia with viral infection came with, he came with hemoglobin 6.1 who required urgent blood transfusion uh, as he was symptomatic. So same way uh, you might get patients with severe anemia who required urgent blood transfusion maybe at the middle of night or weekend. Maybe you can't arrange investigations to find out online course before blood transfusion. So in that situation, you can keep the transfusion samples, maybe two or three EDTA tubes in the fridge door. Then following day, you could send them for a special test like blood film examination or comb test. And also you have to make sure you have taken HBLZ or sample for hemoglobin electrophoresis to exclude hemoglobinopathy if you suspect or uh, if you want to exclude hemoglobinopathy for your patient. Uh, because if you transuse, we have to wait for another three or four months to arrange these tests to confirm hemoglobinopathy. So let's move to case number five. She is a 13-year girl presented with tiredness for five days duration. Again, she had ectrus, halo, and mild splenomegaly. Her full blood count showed bicytopenia with hemoglobin 5.1 and platelet 70 in 10 to the power nine per liter. So similar findings, same as her previous boy. So investigations were carried, carried out to find out underlying cause. Her blood film, I showed numerous spherocytes, numerous spherocytes, many polychromatic cells like this, and some nucleated red blood cells. So morphological features uh, were suggestive of warm type autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It was 
confirmed my comb test positivity and IgG specificity. So it was warm type autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Also, she got thrombocytopenia and all features were suggestive of immune thrombocytopenia, ITP. So her final diagnosis was Ivan syndrome because it was a combination of autoimmune hemolytic anemia and ITP. I performed bone marrow biopsy for this girl before starting steroids to exclude hematological malignancies because steroids can mask underlying malignancy and sometimes can affect histological findings as well. But we don't have to do bone marrow biopsy each and every cytopenia cases before starting steroids. But if it is clinical, uh, if it is obvious ITP or a feature suggestive of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and there's no clinical features suggestive of uh, malignancy, we can uh, straight away start steroids and other supportive care. But in all doubtful cases, before to be better to arrange bone marrow biopsy before starting steroids. For her case, she came with bicytopenia, so we did it, uh, bone marrow biopsy, and her biopsy was compatible to Ivan syndrome. Uh, fortunately, she responded to a short course of steroid. Here's number six. Again, 13 years old girl presented with tiredness for two weeks. Uh, she got pallor and mild splenomegaly. Her full blood count showed again severe pancytopenia with leukopenia, hemoglobin 4.1 with platelet count of 8 in 10 to the power 9 per liter. So same age as previous, but no ictorus for this girl. She had pancytopenia with severe anemia and severe thrombocytopenia. So we investigated to exclude malignancy. Her blood film showed non-chromic normocytic red cells with uh, polychromatic cells and also large and giant platelets compared to normal sized platelets. It is a feature of this kind of large and giant platelets is a feature of ITP or a peripheral destruction. So uh, anyway, she got a severe thrombocytopenia due to ITP and that leads to menorrhagia causing severe anemia. Her ANA test was positive. That could be the reason he, she has got mild leukopenia. It was transit. Anyway, uh, she didn't fulfill SLE criteria at that point. Her bone marrow was active. Uh, so we have started narrative cell transfusion with steroid treatment, but gradually uh, she was steroid dependent. Uh, then a second line immunosuppression of uh, MMF was started, but uh, she lost respond uh, to MMF after six months of treatment. Uh, now she is on thrombocytin receptor agonist of oral L thrombopack. Hope she will uh, respond to that treatment. So let's uh, discuss with the take home messages uh, of this. So considering all about cases. Uh, proper history and physical examination is very important. Uh, I don't know whether you have noticed that all cases were referred mentioning mild or moderate splenomegaly. Yes, we get a, a, a reference like that, but when I asked doctors, did you examine or measure the spleen size, the most frequent answer was no, it was proven by ultrasound scan abdomen. Yes, we get reports of uh, ultrasound scan uh, mentioning that prominent spleen, mild spleen, or a, a mild moderate spleen, but I don't think ultrasound scan or radiologic imaging is a substitution for a clinical examination because if you measure the size of the spleen with proper examination technique, you know whether it is clinically significant or not. Okay, so size of the spleen or grading like whether it is mild, moderate or severe is very important, especially in hematological cases and it will help you to narrow, narrow down at your diagnosis. Let's move to case number seven. 
uh, his 24 years previously healthy boy presented with hematemesis. He got pallor and mild splenomegaly, and they did uh, urgent full blood count and found normal white cells with severe anemia. Hemoglobin was 3.8 gram per deciliter and platelet tin in 10 to the power 9 per litre. Actually, he was admitted to a peripheral hospital at Saturday night with severe hematomasis, and their clinical diagnosis was ITP with acute blood loss. So they required urgent hematology opinion regarding steroid treatment and platelet transfusion. But I do not recommend to start steroid without blood film examination because high dose of steroid can mask some hematological malignancy. So in cases of thrombocytopenia with blood loss, you could start other measures like IV or oral travexamic acid, uh, depending on the type or severity of bleeding if there is no contraindication for tranexamic acid. Obviously, you could start red cell transfusion if patient has severe anemia, and uh, even platelet transfusion is not a contraindication in ITP. You can transfuse platelet uh, if there is severe bleeding, but we all know that premature destruction of transfuse platelet can occur uh, because of autoantibodies, so we can transfuse platelet with IVIG cover. Also, we can use other measures to stop bleeding. Uh, for example, in our case, we can arrange a GI endoscopy and banding to stop hematomasis. Uh, so depending on the type and the severity of bleeding, you could use the other uh, measures. Uh, but I think uh, we have to arrange blood films as soon as possible. Before starting steroids, you can request hematology lab or a hematologist uh, for an urgent blood film in this kind of uh, cases. So we arranged urgent blood film uh, for that boy and it showed a typical lymphocyte. So his diagnosis was lymphoma. So we arranged uh, bone marrow biopsy, flow cytometry and specific uh, management after doing acute management at peripheral unit. So if we go through his full blood count again, I don't know whether you notice his full blood count, he has got a relative lymphocytosis, even though he got total white cell count of normal. Uh, sometimes uh, you, you could see uh, this kind of changes in full blood count, and you might guess there could be abnormalities inside uh, his blood, but uh, it's not always happening. So let's move to case number eight. Uh, 23 years old boy presented with gum bleeding and tiredness. He was pale, but there's no lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly. So he has got severe pancytopenia, leukopenia with severe neutropenia with hemoglobin 3.8 gram per deciliter with platelet count of 7 in 10 to the power 9 per litre. Again, young boy with severe pancytopenia. So we did all uh, relevant investigation to find out uh, the cause, including bone marrow biopsy. Uh, so you could see, this is uh, his uh, bone marrow trephine biopsy. You could see the cellularity of this uh, trephine biopsy compared to a normal biopsy of his age. He got markedly hypocellular bone marrow and finally got the diagnosis of aplastic anemia. Um, but we couldn't uh, find a HLA match donor for allogeny bone marrow transplant for this patient, uh, but fortunately he responded to ATG and cyclosporine treatment and now he is transfusion independent. Okay, then uh, let's move to case number nine. Uh, she is a 20 years old girl who had mitral replacement on warfarin, admitted to a peripheral hospital. They have started treatment as prosthetic valve endocarditis according to the clinical findings. 
Uh, actually, uh, she was admitted to a peripheral hospital at early era of COVID infection. I'm sure you all could remember there was a big barrier or a resistance between healthcare workers and patients uh, at this uh, period. So it was very difficult to arrange proper cardiology referral from peripherals and transesophageal echo to confirm a cardiac vegetation at that point. Uh, anyway, she was on antibiotics for three weeks. At the beginning, uh, she was given IV vancomycin and IV levofloxacin, and later on converted to oral linosolid. So while she is, uh, while she was in the ward on uh, antibiotic treatment, she had complained, loss of appetite, loss of weight, and uh, had low grade fever. Full blood count showed again pancytopenia with leukopenia and hemoglobin 8.2 gram per deciliter with platelet count of 32 and 10 to the power 9 per liter. Uh, so I went to see the patient and uh, I went uh, through the history and uh, found she had neutrophil leukocytosis on admission and no cytopenia. So it was obvious cytopenias developed with treatment while in the board. So uh, then I wanted to examine her. So I asked her to remove her face mask. Uh, actually, uh, I couldn't find a similar uh, horrible picture from the internet uh, to find uh, similar to her mouth. Actually, uh, this is another picture. Uh, lips, mouth, and uh, uh, pharynx are full of uh, oral thrush. She was severely dehydrated and looked ill. So now it is obvious why she complained loss of appetite and loss of weight and why she had low grade fever. So do you know how many clinical signs are masked by face mask? Okay. So fortunately nowadays COVID is not an excuse for any of us to miss any clinical signs. We have to examine patients correctly. So uh, again, you have to remember that fungal infection is very common after prolonged use of uh, antibiotics. Uh, anyway, it, uh, she was recovered with local and systemic antifungal treatment. Uh, so back to uh, her pancytopenia. Uh, with uh, further evaluation, uh, it was diagnosed as drug-induced or antibiotic-induced pancytopenia. So linosolid is one of the commonest antibiotic causing pancytopenia. So she was fully recovered two weeks after stopping all antibiotics. So I would like to emphasize that drug-induced cytopenias are not uncommon. So we get referrals to arrange bone marrow biopsy to investigate cytopenias. Uh, sometimes patient is on methotrexate, immunosuppressions like azotabrin or chemotherapy. So please go through detailed history of drug and work out whether there's a possibility of pancytopenia with these offending drugs. Uh, because uh, most of our patients have no idea uh, about their drugs, not like other developed or uh, European countries. They have no idea what other drugs they are on. And sometimes they think it's just a weekly drug and may not affect to his uh, full blood count. Uh, so they have no idea about uh, side effects. So please uh, make sure you have taken detailed drug history as well. Okay, let's... Uh, more to my last case, mm, case number 10. 28 years old woman complained weakness of body, uh, loss of appetite and loss of weight for two to three months duration. Again, her full blood count showed pancytopenia with leukopenia and hemoglobin 7.2 gram per deciliter with platelet 70 in 10 to the power nine per liter. So she was referred to me to exclude malignancy. Her blood film was leukoerythroblastic. What does this mean? Uh, we can see uh, immature red blood cells, like nucleated red blood cells, all these kind of NRBCs. Uh, usually we don't see in normal uh, people blood. 
uh, and also a lift shifted uh, white cell lineage for myelocytes, myelocytes, and occasional blood cells uh, in uh, blood films. So we call this kind of uh, blood films as leukoerythroblastic. Uh, so it's more likely bone marrow infiltration considering her history. So I arranged bone marrow biopsy as we suspect. Uh, her trifine biopsy showed uh, bone marrow infiltration by adenocarcinoma. So, uh, later on, uh, we found that she had undiagnosed breast cancer, which had metastasized. Um, so, uh, considering all cases, proper history and uh, clinical examination are mandatory in all cases and especially in hemorrhagical cases as well. So it will reduce unnecessary investigations and uh, mismanagement of your patient. Okay, uh, unraveling cytopenias can be raveled using this instrument. Uh, so as a hematology, we can see beyond our normal vision through this microscope and it takes us to a wonderful cell world. Actually, we all are really enjoying with this cell morphology and always happy to help you all with our specialty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vishaka Rajapaksha, for that interesting and informative talk. Let's move on to the last talk, uh, which is on practical approach to evaluate thrombotic microangiopathies. And the talk is going to be delivered by Dr. Nadishani Edirivikrama, consultant clinical hematologist, teaching hospital, Kurunagala. Over to you, Dr. Nadishani. Thank you, Dr. Ganesha. And first of all, let me thank uh, Ceylon College of Physicians as well as SLCH for inviting me to deliver the talk on uh, thrombotic micro and uh, the practical approach uh, to evaluate thrombotic microangiopathies. So let's first uh, uh, have a look what thrombotic microangiopathies are. So the name itself suggests that there's a component of thrombosis which occurs in small or micro vessels. And it is characterized by hemolytic anemia to be more specific microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, low platelets, and resulting organ damage due to organ hypoperfusion. And it's a rare condition. However, it is associated with life-threatening uh, complications. Therefore, you need to have a high degree of clinical suspicion and um, uh, has to be managed quickly. Yeah, okay. So, um, so these are a few examples for, uh, uh, examples for TMAs disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, venom-induced thrombosis thrombocytopenia, malignant hypertension, catastrophic APLS. Out of these, I would touch on the first three uh, in my talk. I think uh, even though VITP is quite common among this part of the world, it needs a separate lecture. So therefore, I would uh, briefly touch on the first three examples. So this is what happens in all the TMAs. What happens in is this is a cross section of a, a, a micro vessel, and what is demonstrated or what is illustrated in blue lines are von Willebrand factors, and it's crowded by lots of platelets. So here there's a clot formation, but uh, I mean to be more specific, it's a platelet clot, and uh, when the red blood cells pass through this clot, it it breaks giving rise to what we call microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And these fragmented red cells can be seen in the blood picture. Okay, so let's begin with DIC. This case I have come across when I was a trainee at NHSL, a 65 year old female who was diagnosed with diabetes and ischemic heart disease, presented with severe cellulitis of the left lower limb. She had fever and uh, CRP was quite high. On admission, she was having neutrophil leukocytosis, and there was marginal anemia and platelet was low normal. Subsequently, she developed uh, the, her neutrophil leukocytosis uh, got worse and she developed significant bicytopenia. 
and on day five of admission, her hemoglobin was 7.2 and platelet dropped to 86. Therefore, she was referred to, and at the same time, she developed concentricite bleeding, so she was referred to hematology. And at the hematology department, uh, we did a coagulation profile and uh, res uh, results showed deranged PPN APTT. And we also performed a plus fibrinogen level, which was marginally low. And this is what the blood picture, uh, how the blood picture looked like. Here you can see there are some normochromic, normocytic red cells and some polychromatic cells and here and there some fragmented red cells. So here we got a patient who is having sepsis in the background with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia and deranged coagulation profile. So this is likely to be BIC. We don't have one particular test to diagnose BIC. So we, therefore, the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis has a derived uh, a scoring system to predict the possibility of BIC. Here, they uh, uh, take platelets, PT, fibrinogen, and D-dimer levels into consideration. In our patient, we didn't do D-dimer uh, because it was not available at that time. So if the collective score is more than five, it's highly likely that you are dealing with a patient with BIC. So let's have a uh, look at the pathophysiology of uh, DIC. So always to diagnose DIC, you need to have a, a background disease that can cause DIC like sepsis. Uh, I will uh, tell you what the causes for uh, DIC are. So what happens in because of this underlying fact, uh, etiology, you get exposure of tissue factor and thereby activation of the coagulation system. There will be lots of thrombin clot formation. For those that clot formation, platelets will be consumed. And at the same time, once the clot, the clots are formed, the fibrolytic pathway will get activated. So as a result of the consumption of the coagulation, increased fibrinolysis and thrombocytopenia, patient will experience bleeding. So in DIC, it's always a balance between uh, thrombo, throm, uh, bleeding and thrombosis. So, if, uh, so you have to uh, always bear that in mind uh, when managing these patients. So these are a few common causes for the EIC. Uh, sepsis, particularly gram-negative sepsis. In our patient, it was a sepsis that was caused in the EIC. It will lead to, I mean, what happens in the EIC is it will lead to tissue damage and exposure of endothelium, thereby tissue factor exposure. So that, that will result in the EIC. In polytrauma, again, because of release tissue, because of widespread tissue damage, tissue factors will ex uh, expose. And in certain malignancies, like classical examples are uh, acute thromalistic leukemias, adenocarcinomas, on the surface of those cells, they will uh, the, uh, the, the tumor cells will express tissue factor. So that might lead to BIC. And certain obstetric complications like placental abruption, return products of placenta, septic abortion, preeclampsia, all can lead to uh, DIC. Okay, so how are you going to manage these patients? So first you have to identify the etiology and treat it. So unless you treat the etiology, you won't be able to get rid of, uh, the, uh, uh, get rid of DIC. The management of DIC per se is supportive. So you can do blood transfusions. I must, I will say the arbitrary threshold would be somewhere around eight grams per deciliter. And FFP can be given if patient is a bleeder and a PT and APTT ratios are more than 1.5 times the normal. The dose is 15 milligrams per kg. And platelet uh, uh, transfusions are only needed if, platelet, if, uh, if patient is a bleeder, the threshold would be 50. And if not, the threshold would be 20. So in our patient, fibrinogen was also low because of the consumption. However, so by giving FFP, you can, uh, uh, it, it itself, FFP itself contains some amount of fibrinogen. So by giving FFP, you can treat hypofibrogenemia as well. However, if fibrinogen remains less than one gram per deciliter, despite giving FFP, then you can think of giving fibrinogen concentrate or cryoprecipitate. So fibrinogen concentrate was, is not frequently available in the government sector. It's, it's particularly important, firstly, and it's particularly important in patients who are volume overloaded. You can't give 
this much of volume to patients. So usually three grams of fibrinogen will increase uh, plasma fibrinogen by one gram. If you are going to give cryoprecipitate, which is the more uh, readily available product in the government sector, you can give two pools of cryo. Uh, fine. So apart from that, you can give vitamin K as well. So by giving vitamin K, you can re replenish vitamin K dependent protein factors. And if bleeding is predominant, you can give, try some tranexamic acid. And during the particularly during the recovery phase, uh, it's, man, it's advisable to give at least prophylactic dose of uh, heparin because at the recovery phase, when these protein factors are restored, there's a high chance of the patient getting a thrombus. So it, the, uh, the heparin dose needs to be escalated to a thrombo, uh, uh, treatable treatment dose if you have demonstrate a clot. Okay, so what's there in the pipeline? The recombinant human soluble thrombomoduline. Uh, there are so many studies carry, being carried on uh, regarding this, uh, and it has proven or shown uh, mortality and uh, reduced reduce mortality and morbidity in patients with DIC. Uh, the next, I would like to uh, talk on thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And this patient I have come across again when I was working at NHSL as, a, as an acting consultant. A 36 year old female was diagnosed uh, with SLE and was on immunosuppressants, presented with altered level of consciousness for two days duration. And at the very beginning, the differentials that the medical team were thinking was whether it's a uh, CNS infection or uh, whether it could be a cerebral lupus or thrombosis. Uh, in uh, the uh, cerebral circulation. The initial uh, investigations were done and full blood count showed significant bicytopenia, but the coagulation profile was normal. CRP was done, which was more or less non marginally elevated. Creatinine was also marginally elevated. Liver functions were normal except for raised ASD and bilirubin. There was mild protein, protein urea and CT brain was normal. There wasn't any bleed no a thrombosis. Since they are, because of this marked by cytopenia, she was referred to hematology, and this is what we saw. She had a uh, marked, uh, I mean, significant red cell fragmentation here and there, and you can see a few polychromatic cells, and these tiny little cells are microspherocytes. Those are remnants of the cells. So once they are broken, the rest re remaining parts can get together and form a small red cell, which we call microspherocyte. Okay? So this is what we saw. So we, here we got a patient who is having an autoimmune background, presenting with all the level of consciousness, having microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with normal coagulation profile and marked, marked mildly uh, raised serum creatinine. So this led us for the diagnosis of the suspicion of TTP. So classically, TTP is associated with pentad of clinical features. Anemia, uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal failure, and neurological findings. Usually, the neurological findings, usually they present with order level of consciousness, and sometimes with headaches as well. So if you suspect TTP, these are the investigations that you should perform. LDH has to be done. So LDH can be elevated as a marker of hemolysis because LDH is an enzyme that you can find inside the red cells. But here in TTP, LDH will be markedly elevated. It's not merely because of hemolysis, but also because of tissue hypoperfusion. Okay? So LDH is also considered as a disease monitoring marker. Serum bilirubin can be elevated, particularly the indirect component because of hemolysis, but because of ischemia to liver, you can also see an indirect, uh, sorry, direct component can also go up. Retic count will be elevated. Renal functions have to be done, like in our patient, and you have to assess the cardiac condition. Because of ischemia, they can get ECG changes and elevated tropic level. At a PS13 level, activity or antibody levels, is the, uh, the diagnostic test that we ideally need to perform. However, it's not available in the government sector. It's available in the private sector and cost, costs around 50,000 Sri Lankan rupees. So in clinical practice, actually, we can't afford to do uh, ADAMTS 13 levels. 
And if you happen to do, you have to take samples before you start on treatment. And along with these investigations, you have to start investigating for a cause as well. So in our patient, it was SLE, the likely cause, but again, uh, it's wise to look for other causes like HIV and possible malignancies when in the workup. So, uh, so this is what the ADAMTS-13 is. ADAMTS-13 is an enzyme, metalloprotease enzyme. The function of it is to cleave this ultra-large one millibond factors. So this is the cross-section of a, a endothel a blood vessel. This is the endothelium. This ultra-large uh, one millibond multimers are secreted from this endothelial cell. Once it's secreted, this ADAMTS-13 has to cleave this off. Otherwise, the platelet binding sites will be exposed. So once it's cleaved, they convoluted, and these platelet binding sites will be, I hope I'm clear to you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Sorry, I just got a message that my internet connection on that very really good so yeah so um so one is in the natural or the normal convoluted and the platelets won't bind but what happens in a formation the hemostatic path that this will be exposed. What happens in TTP? There will be deficiency in ADMTS-13 enzyme or with antibodies to ADMTS-13. This uncleaved ultra-large one millibond factors in certain age. So Now? Yes. Dishani. Yeah. Sorry for that interruption. Um, sorry. So I, I was talking about uh, the difference between the acquired and congenital TTP. Uh, yeah. So most adults will have acquired TTP where there will be autoantibodies against ADAMTS-13. And uh, there's another entity called congenital TTP where there is mutations coding ADAMTS-13 gene resulting in a deficiency of ADAMTS-13. And um, I would stick to uh, acquired TTP as most of the audience are treating the adults. Um, okay. Since, uh, so in the absence of ADAMTS-13 activity or antibody levels, you can use our, either of any of these scoring system to suspect or predict the possibility of TTP. There are two scoring systems, French score and plasmic score of these. Plasmic score is the most popular one. They are, they can consider platelet count, creatinine, hemolytic parameters, coagulation profile, and MCV into consideration. So uh, if uh, so if you get a score, for example, if you get a score of six to seven, that means there's a 62 to 82% chance of ADAMTS-13 level being less than 10%. 
This 10% is the magic number. If any, if anything less than uh, less than 10%, we consider as uh, TTP. So by using this score, even in the absence of Adam TS13, you can get a sort of a guidance to diagnose TTP. So once you make the diagnosis, how are you going to manage these patients? First, you have to identify them. Uh, why, why you are starting treatment, commencing on treatment, you have to treat uh, the etiology as well. Because without uh, treating the etiology, you might not be able to get rid of the uh, TTP. So what could be the possible etiologies? Pregnancy, HIV, SLE, pancreatitis are some known conditions associated with TTP. Apart from that, there are certain conditions that may mimic TTP, like uh, malignancies, drugs, such as calcineurin inhibitors, we do often see uh, microangiopathic hemolysis occurs uh, uh, fragmented red cells uh, in patients who are taking, particularly in post-KT patients who are on uh, cyclosporine. So clopidogrel, simvastatin, quinine, and some chemotherapy, allogenic stem cell transplant are conditions associated or mimic conditions like TTP. Uh, but pathophysiology is sort of different. Uh, and uh, so once you make the diagnosis, without any hesitation, you have to start the patient on therapeutic plasma exchange. This is what happens in therapeutic plasma exchange. You remove uh, blood from the patient's circulation and separate cellular component from plasma. And the cellular component will be given back to the patient while you discard the uh, plasma component and you can replace the plasma component with either maybe you can replace with a uh, normal sal saline, albumin or FFP. In TTP you have to replace or you have to choose the re replacement solution uh, as FFP. So you have this so usually the recommendation is to do one remove 1.5 volumes daily for three days followed by one volume daily or you can tail it off depending on uh, the response the patient that uh, response the, the patient showing to plasma exchange and it has to be carried out uh, until the platelet count is more than 150. And the recommended or the standard replacement uh, solution would be solvent detergent FFP. Solvent detergent is a, a sort of a, tree, a detergent FFP is a kind of an FFP which was treated with the solvent detergent to reduce the uh, viral transmission. However, unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, we don't have SPFFP, therefore we give normal FFP to the patient. And you know, in real life, even if I say, even I say you have to do a therapeutic plasma exchange as quickly as possible, in real life, it's actually difficult to arrange PPE. So in the absence, so if there's a delay in arranging TPE, you have to give large doses of FFP. The purpose of doing a plasma exchange is to remove ultra-large von Willebrand factors and to give some working or normal Adam TS13 enzyme to patient. By do, giving FFP, at least if you can't, even if you can't remove antibodies and uh, ultra-large von Willebrand factors, you can give some uh, Adam TS13 to the patient. So that can, you can buy some time uh, until you arrange therapeutic plasma exchange. Okay. So along with plasma exchange, you have to start the patient on steroids. It can be in the form of methylprednisolone or oral prednisolone. Rituximab um, as the anti-CD20 antibodies need to be started along with. Uh, initially, it was thought that it should be, the recommendation was to uh, give it to uh, patients who are having cardiac and neurological involvement. However, the current recommendation is to give it to all patients with TTP. Capuzizumab is the latest development. A monoclonal antibody uh, has to be given to patients who are diagnosed uh, uh, with TTP using uh, Adam TS13 levels. In other words, who are having confirmed diagnosis. I will discuss uh, what capuzizumab is in my next few slides, and then the supportive care. The supportive care. Uh, uh, is important and uh, the, it's important to uh, bear in mind that you should avoid platelet transfusions unless there's a life-threatening bleed. 
And what about putting a central line there? Because the vascular transfusion team prior starting uh, plasma exchange might request for a vascular. So the recommendation is to put vascular irrespective of the platelet count. And blood transfusions can be given to uh, pick up, uh, to bring the hemoglobin back. I might, I might say the arbitrary hemoglobin level would be somewhere around eight. Unless the patient is having a cardiac involvement, you can have, a, in such situations, you can have a higher threshold. And it's recommended to start the patient on low dose heparin and prophylactic low molecule heparin once the platelet count reached to more than 50. And folic acid need to be given since it's a hemolytic condition. And uh, then the latest development is caplosisumab. It's a monoclonal antibody that binds with the platelet binding site of this ultra large one milligram factor. So with this drug, we, we uh, the by giving this drug, there won't be platelet uh, binding to this ultra large one milligram factor. They are by the patho. So you are treating the pathophysis and reducing the uh, amount of clot formation. And this is the landmark Hercules study published in 2019 in uh, NHAM, where they have uh, uh, studied caplosisumab against placebo and found that there's a five times more uh, significantly improving uh, uh, improvement in platelet count compared to the placebo arm, as well as the ADAMTS-13 activity restoration was significantly higher in the capacitive arm. Okay. And uh, again, this is another uh, upcoming drug, human recombinant ADAMTS-13 is passing its uh, phase uh, two clinical trials, particularly would be important in treating congenital TTP, where you can give recombinant atom TS13 periodically to replace the absent enzyme. Finally, I would be talking on hemolytic uremic syndrome. And uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, so let's more go to the case number three. Uh, this patient I came across when I was working at Castle Street Hospital, a 28-year-old patient uh, uh, who has delivered her second baby two days back, uh, uh, transferred from the local hospital with reduced urine output, altered level of consciousness, and yellow color discoloration of eyes. So at this point, the obstetric team was considering whether it's going to be a pre eclampsia or health syndrome, uh, and uh, blood pressure was normal. The further investigations were carried out. The serum creatinine was uh, four, it was markedly elevated, and liver functions were done uh, because they had health, uh, suspicion of health in the background. AST and bilirubin were high, but rest of the liver function was normal. Serum, uh, CRP was marginally elevated, and full blood count showed uh, marked significant bicytopenia. So at this point, uh, I was called to see this patient. Uh, and when I saw the blood picture, it showed my microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And the coagulation profile was done, which was normal. Since they were suspecting the possibility of uh, any CNS thrombosis, and with the low platelet count, the possibility of CNS bleed, with all the level of consciousness, they did a CT brain, which was normal. So here I am with the patient, I, I, I see this patient who is in, the, her, in her immediate postpartum period with uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, normal coagulation profile, and markedly deranged uh, creatinine, uh, renal functions presenting uh, in her immediate postpartum period. And so here we are left with the diagnosis. So since there's microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, so we have the, this narrowed down the differential diagnosis. Since the coagulation profile is normal, I would narrow down my differentials to further either to TTP or HUS. Since there is marker derangement in uh, creatinine, I think uh, I thought this I'm going I'm dealing with the patient with HUS. So. The HUS is classically uh, uh, characterized by three or triad of clinical features, microangiopathic hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, and uh, significant renal insufficiency. Uh, conventionally, HUS is categorized into two, shiga toxin secreting 
in E. coli related HUAs and atypical HUAs. And uh, in uh, modern literature, some authors talk about secondary HUAs. However, the pathophysiology is more or less similar to atypical HUAs. Therefore, for the ease of reference, let me stick on to this conventional classification. Okay, so what happens in shiga toxin producing E. coli is this E. coli will be producing shiga toxin, which will come into the circulation and can it will damage the endothelial cells, which will result in microclot formation. Why there's renal uh, preponderance? So it is thought that uh, this uh, shiga toxin is bound to GB3 receptors, and this GB3 receptors, receptors are predominantly or from prevalently found in renal parenchyma. This is just one explanation why you get a predominant or market uh, renal uh, involvement in HUS. In atypical HUS, the pathophysiology is different where the complement pathway comes into the picture. So you know there are basically, I mean, broadly there are classical two pathways, classical and alternative pathways. And uh, what happens in atypical HUS is there will be genetic mutations in uh, these regulatory molecules like pactage, pacti, there are so many other molecules. Because of this abnormality of these regulatory molecules, there will be constant or uh, uh, uncontrolled activation of alternative pathway, which will result in membrane attack complex formation. But mere presence of these genetic mutations will not be adequate to cause atypical HUS. There has to be a trigger always. So these are examples for these triggers, infections, drugs, vaccination, autoimmune diseases, pregnancy, malignancy, cancer chemotherapy, transplantation, all can be triggers for these patients to get atypical HUS. And usually in atypical HUS, along with these triggers, there has to be a genetic uh, mutation in the background. So diagnosis is mainly clinical. And uh, unlike in TTP, we do not have a particular diagnostic test to diagnose HUS. So it's a clinical diagnosis. But you can do Adam TS13 to prove that it's not TTP. If you get a, a level, a Adam TS level of more than 10%, you can safely exclude the possibility of TTP. And you can send off stool for shiga toxin. And there's no and there, whether and there's a, a debate whether doing complement levels will be of any use. The complement levels will be low in it's atypical HUS or as in other DNAs. Therefore, uh, because whenever there is this activation of the clotting pathway and there are the, then there are other uh, uh, steps and all things are setting on, the complement levels can go down anyway. So there's no use of doing complement levels to diagnose atypical HUS. Certain and mutation analysis for complements can be done. It will be useful, uh, useful to predict recurrences or relapses, but not to manage this acute episode. Okay, so how are you going to manage HUS? Mainly, uh, managing HUS is mainly supportive. You can give blood transfusions, and uh, similarly, like in TTP, beta transfusions should be avoided. And most of these patients will need hemodialysis. And folic acid can be given, and since it's a hemolytic condition. And sometimes, because of this kidney involvement as well as the complement pathway involvement, they can get hypertension, uh, which might need antihypertensives. Plasma exchange will be of use uh, to manage atypical HUS, and particularly it is recommended if you if in the absence of eglizumab. I will tell what eglizumab is. It's a drug uh, in my next slide, and eglizumab is particularly given for atypical HUS. The shiga toxin related HUS usually the much more prevalent found in kids. And the place for antibiotics is not really proven or certain, but you can, uh, there is no harm in trying some uh, and give, uh, giving acid, some acetromycin. Okay, uh, so this is what eclosinab is. It's a, anti, it's a monoclonal antibody that binds with complement factor V. So by binding to this, it will prevent conversion into uh, activated uh, uh, complement factor 5A, and thereby it will prevent ultimately the membrane attack complex formation. So uh, this is a landmark study where they uh, demonstrated the benefit of giving eclosumab in atypical HUS. This was published in uh, 
uh, NHAM into 2030, the, uh, they are where they have found improvement in EGFR and platelet count in the agrozinab arm. So um, in atypical HUS, uh, most, almost all patients will get, uh, all patients get uh, kidney involvement and about 90% of them will need dialysis. And of them, about half will require long-term dialysis. In other words, they will go into end-stage renal disease. It's quite unfortunate that kidney transplant is also not going to be a useful option because of the risk of recurrence. So in uh, developed countries where eclizumab is available, what they do is they give eclizumab to prevent recurrence, so to protect this uh, transplanted kidney. Uh, Unfortunately, that's not available in our setup. And what, what we can do or we can, can try is to con uh, do a combined kidney and liver transplant. So liver is where with these complement factors or regulatory molecules are uh, synthesized. So uh, this act, uh, it's recommended to do combined liver and kidney transplant to as a treatment measure to end stage renal disease uh, developed following atypical HUS. Okay, these are my references uh, and thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take up any questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions, Dr. Anoma? There, there's one question uh, to Dr. Amila. Uh, there's uh, one question. What is the choice of hemostatic therapy for venom-induced consumption coagulopathy? After wipe by, uh, is it FFP, pyknogen, or cryoprecipitate? And what what coagulation test can decide on the choice? Amila. Uh, yeah, the venom induced uh, consumptive coagulopathy it causes uh, multiple factor deficiencies because of the activation of uh, coagulation cascade and consumptive coagulopathy. So. According to the available uh, trials and recommendations, it is not recommended to uh, give uh, clotting factors with blood products if patient is not having bleeding. The mainstay of treatment is antivenom therapy. If patient develop bleeding only, then we can correct clotting factors according to the abnormal uh, result. So we can do a PT and APTT and fibrinogen. So we can expect a prolongation of PT and APTT and low fibrinogen level and thrombocytopenia. So if patient develop, even after giving clotting uh, uh, antivenom therapy, if patient develops significant bleeding, so we can uh, keep uh, PT INR at a safe level, less than 1.5 with FFP transfusion and platelet level more than 50,000 with platelet transfusions. These are supportive uh, blood transfusions. Okay, thank you, Amila. Okay. Welcome. Thank you very much again. Uh, in the absence of further questions and the interest of time, let me conclude today's session. And thank you very much for all four speakers, Dr. Omega Vikramasinghe, Dr. Amila Amarasena, Dr. Vishaka Rajapaksa, and Dr. Nadishan Idri Vikrama for conducting a fantastic uh, session on important hematological conditions. And I would like to... Uh, share the certificate of appreciation to the three speakers, Dr. Amila Amarasena and Dr. Vishaka Rajapaksa and Dr. Nadishani Adirivikrama. Thank you once again. We would also like to extend our appreciation to Dr. Anoma Veeravardhana, the president of the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists and Professor Senani Williams, consultant hematologist and one of our CCP council member for the uh, tireless effort to make this month's hematology lecture series a success. And um, we would be uh, conducting CCP quiz on hematology over the next two weeks. And we will share the exact date and the time uh, so you can attempt the quiz, so which will be based on all the lectures that we have conducted over this month. And finally, I would like to thank 
Mr. Nalina Vanasinghe, impressive events uh, for the support with the AV, and also two of our demonstrators, Mayumi and Kalpana, for the support with the uh, posters and the publishing. And uh, this is uh, the uh, this we have another speciality uh, lecture series which will be uh, on month of December. That's going to be on endocrinology. So you can uh, join with us on the speciality update on endocrinology on 20th December, uh, and that'll be the last speciality update for this year. And next CCP activity which is coming up uh, is our book club, which will be on this uh, Saturday, 6th of uh, December. So I hope you all can join with the book club. Thank you very much and have a pleasant evening and afternoon. Thank you.